Hi, I'm Carl Azus for CNN Student News. Jumping right in, a U.S. warship was recently targeted by two missiles near the Middle Eastern country of Yemen. An American military spokesman said the USS Mason was in international waters in the southern part of the Red Sea when the attack happened. The ship deployed onboard defensive measures. The missiles missed their apparent target, hit the water, caused no damage. But where did they come from? The U.S. says they were launched from a part of Yemen controlled by Houthi rebels. Who are the Houthis? They're a group that drove out the Yemeni president and government last year. The Houthis have taken control of much of war-torn Yemen, but they deny that they targeted the U.S. warship. This goes deeper, though. The Houthis are a Shia Muslim group, and they're supported by Iran, a mostly Shia Muslim country. But they're opposed by Saudi Arabia, a mostly Sunni Muslim country that's leading other nations in attacks against the Houthis. Tensions between Shia and Sunni Muslims date back centuries. When Islam's founder, the Prophet Muhammad, died in the 7th century, his followers were split over who should take over. Abu Bakr was one follower they wanted to choose. Others wanted his cousin and son-in-law, Ali. Ali became the leader for all Muslims for five years before he was killed. His son Hussein was killed in battle by what were to become the Sunnis. Since then, the followers of Ali have been known as Shia. Across the world, the vast majority of Muslims are Sunnis. What makes the Middle East so complicated are the maps that were drawn and the national boundaries that were put down about a century ago when British and other empires were pulling back from the region. And the struggle for power today has its roots in how the region was divided, how those maps were drawn. The situation in Yemen, where there are rebels fighting government forces, a humanitarian crisis with people displaced, outside countries involved, terrorists getting a foothold, it all sounds a lot like what's happening in the Middle Eastern country of Syria. Though that nation's government has more control there, what will happen in Syria in the days ahead is also uncertain. Among the estimated 11 million Syrians who've had to leave their homes since the civil war began, CNN's Fred Pleitgen caught up with one young man whose memories of where he used to live are treasured in volumes. For almost four years, this was the reality in Daraya. A suburb of Damascus controlled by the rebels, but besieged by Syrian government forces. Amid the shelling, the shortages of food, water and medicine, a space of quiet, of reading, of solace. A secret underground library. The chief librarian, a 14-year-old boy named Amjad. I liked the place and I liked learning things. I liked to read, Amjad told us. In August, the rebels made a deal with the Syrian government for free passage out of Daraya in return for government control of the district. We were one of the first crews to make it in after the evacuation. Amid the flattened and damaged buildings, all of a sudden, we noticed soldiers taking books from a basement. The former secret library of Daraya. Books strewn across the floor, many volumes already gone, but the order of a library still clearly visible. Almost during the entire time of the siege, the underground library here was a sanctuary, especially for the children of Daraya, many of whom would come here braving the dangers to read in peace. All civilians have now left Daraya, but we found the former librarian Amjad in a displaced camp outside Damascus. His eyes lit up when we told him we'd found the library. I would work for hours in the library, he said. I would go in at one and come back at five. I was responsible for everything. For years, the library was the only escape he and the others had from the shelling that killed and wounded so many. Amjad is clear on just how special it was. I cried the last time I was there, he said. I used to love it so much. Daraya is now destroyed and abandoned. The underground library is gone. But it will always hold a special place for Amjad and the others, a quiet space in the hell they faced for almost four years.
Okay, you know what you're supposed to do when you're driving and a light turns yellow, when a sign says yield, when you see an emergency response vehicle behind you, but what about when there's an obstacle on the interstate, or if your car goes into a skid? To help teach people how to deal with that, a former race car driver named Jeff Payne founded a nonprofit defensive driving program called Driver's Edge. He's today's character study. All these kids are dying on our roadways. Families are affected every single day. None of us are really ever taught how to drive. We're just taught to pass the test. Most drivers were never educated on what to do in that emergency situation. I was simply frustrated with the number of kids that are being killed and the number of little white crosses you see along the highway. We hope you all at least come in here with the attitude that you don't know what you don't know and you never stop learning. So I decided to start a free program that would get young drivers behind the wheel and better prepare them for all the hazards that are faced out there. Go, full throttle. We actually put young drivers through skid control exercises, panic braking exercises, the base of lane change movers, experiences that aren't traditionally part of driver's education but that could actually save their life one day out there on the roads. Every one of you guys took that class, how to teach my teenager how to drive, right? Doesn't exist. And we mix that in with some classroom conversations that make a big difference. The driver just took her eyes off the road for a split second, and that small mistake turned to a deadly tragedy. It is a wake-up call. Seatbelt on. It's heartwarming seeing how these kids develop throughout the course. Fast, fast, fast. Off the gas. Straighten it back out, straighten it back out. Oh, come here. Whoa. Don't give up, don't give up. There it is. I like that much better. Cool. If they're doing it perfectly, <laughs> you don't see the car rock whatsoever. It's just very nice and very smooth. The cocky driver that thinks they know everything realizes that, wow, this is a lot more serious than I thought. I need to pay more attention out there. When I'm in the car, I usually get distracted by like my cell phone or like people who are in the car with me. I feel like I've become a safer driver and more responsible. Very good, very good. You nailed it both times. More defensive. That was so much fun. I learned that you'll get through it if you trust the car and stay focused on what you need to do. It's about preparing them for the real world so they don't end up as a statistic. I know we're saving lives. $1,500 might seem a little steep for a single piece of luggage, especially if it's just a carry-on. It only has the capacity of an overnight bag, and at 19 pounds, it's not lightweight. On the other hand, it's not every day you see someone rolling on a rollerboard, literally riding it across the airport. CNN's Jeannie Most takes one for a spin. It's not every day you learn to drive a suitcase. <laughs> Maybe you've seen the moto bag. The motorized suitcase you can ride recently went viral. So when moto bag's creator, Kevin O'Donnell, offered to let us test drive it, so yeah, sit right in the middle there, we decided to carry on. And then lift your handlebars up, place your feet on the pegs. There's a thumb throttle for the electric motor. It's very responsive, so you just take your time to get used to it. Hand brakes like on a bike. How fast am I going right now? Probably going six miles an hour. Top speed, eight. Its state-of-the-art lithium battery can go eight miles. It takes an hour to fully charge it. If you're going ape to have one, prepare to pay 1500 bucks when they start shipping in January. The ride was a little bumpy on New York's cracked sidewalks, but... The airport's just like you're floating on air. Kevin says the moto bag is FAA and TSA compliant, though it remains to be seen if airports would allow them were they to become popular. See you later. <laughs> Genie Mo, CNN, New York. It does take the lug out of luggage, put a zip in your trip, create a new form of motorized transport, and provide a new way to taxi to the terminal. But it'll have to pack some serious orders before we can luggage its success. If you were off school for the Columbus Day holiday, yesterday's program at CNNStudentNews.com has coverage of Hurricane Matthew's impact on the U.S. and some highlights from the second presidential debate. You'll find it in our show archive. <laughs>